A warm welcome to the Friday edition of our City COVID-19 show. I am Michaela Miller. President Cyril Ramaphosa is finally in the Western Cape, accompanied by the Health Minister Zueli Mkhize. They will evaluate the presentation by the Provincial Health Department on the COVID-19 response plan. The Western Cape remains the epicentre of the pandemic in South Africa, with over 27,000 cases and 651 deaths. Head of the Provincial Health Department, Dr. Keith Clutter, highlighted the fact that a net 3.4 billion is required in the current financial year to respond to COVID-19. 33 facilities have been set up across the province, providing over 41,000 beds. A further 280 beds in City of Cape Town resorts are being activated. Critter said 1,662 healthcare workers have been infected by the virus. And now for your headlines. The Bontevoel community gathered for a candlelight vigil on Thursday night as residents mourned the loss of a father and a son killed in gang violence. Now Western Cape has condemned the new testing criteria announced by the provincial government for Cape Metro citizens. Government to appeal a Pretoria High Court that declared Level 3 and 4 lockdown regulations unconstitutional and invalid. It is day 71 of lockdown and South Africa has just had the biggest jump in coronavirus cases since the pandemic began. The current number of confirmed COVID-19 cases nationally is at 40,792, a 3,267 3, spike since yesterday. There have been 21,311 recoveries and 848 deaths. In the Western Cape, there are 27,006 cases, 14,917 recoveries and 651 deaths. The Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force, known as SWET, and two other social justice organizations have demanded an investigation into the death of Alma Robin Mutsumi. The 39-year-old woman was arrested early in April on charges of drug possession. It was alleged she had hanged herself in the cell at Mowbray Police Station. SWET spokesperson Megan Lessin queried why Monsumi had not been given bail and if reports that she was ill had been investigated and medical care given to her. The search for a gunman who shot and killed Dolph residents, Annalene Rangoli, continues. The 38-year-old woman was killed in a car on Tuesday night in Beethoven Street. A 21-year-old nephew was wounded in the incident. Rangoli was murdered shortly after midnight, just a few roads away from home. Meanwhile, a 21-year-old woman was shot through her bedroom window in Manenberg and is recovering in hospital. She is the third person to be shot in Manenberg, the first being a 7-year-old. No arrests have been made in either of these cases. regulations and really just opening up things and and while there's some good in opening up certain things there's obviously some negatives on the other side as well and so we've seen the increase of alcohol abuse drug abuse etc and which fuels and drives gang violence and so over a sustained period of time we've had a specific issue in one part of Pontival which is the S and T block of Pontival and uh, sadly uh, two nights ago a young father, uh, Muhammad Johnson, and his son were shot. The father passed away on the scene uh, 12 hours later after fighting for his life. The two-year-old boy, Radio Johnson, also uh, succumbed, succumbed to his injuries and passed away. 
My concern with this shooting is not only the fact that it is an innocent person, persons that have, that, that have passed away, but more concerning for me is the fact that only 3% of gang-related shootings ever see a court or even bother getting convicted. And so my appeal to the police in Bondiville is to, the South African Police Service in Bondiville is to ensure that every T is cro crossed and every I is dotted, that no stone is left unturned in finding who these perpetrators of the senseless, cold-hearted murder was. These are the sorts of murders that, 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 that are meant to unite communities. And so we ask that the police work with the community to get to the bottom of the situation so that these individuals that have perpetrated these acts will never ever see the light of day again. It is unacceptable to have such cold-hearted, senseless individuals roaming our streets because our detective services aren't able to uh, find these people. We don't have crime intelligence to understand the reason for these things happening. And so there's, while there's a huge responsibility on the community to pass on relevant information, there is equally that same responsibility on the South African police services as well as the criminal justice system to ensure that we are putting these sorts of gangster criminals behind bars and that we are not giving them get out of free jail cards, which are which is seemingly consistently happening in society as we speak. Police and authority should never be uh, negotiating with gangsters. Gangsters must be locked up and the keys must be thrown away. They are breaking our society. They're not just hurting our society. They are taking away the moral fibers of our society. If there was some sort of childhood and agreement between two gangs saying there'll be a ceasefire, I'll never take such things seriously because gangsters are known not to negotiate with each other. They're more interested in breaking our societies down. So from our side, we have what is known as the Triangle Project in Bontable, which we set up a while back, which has helped us reduce gang-related murder by over 50% in the area since 2017. That program, Triangle Project, uh, basically puts myself, uh, law enforcement agencies and the community in, in a bubble, in, in, in a triangle, where communities can personally and confidentially pass on information to me, who I then feed that information through to law enforcement agencies to ensure we act upon that information. That was the voice of Ward Councillor Angus McKenzie who spoke about the recent spike in gang violence. Tigerberg Hospital has tested using high flow oxygen instead of ventilators for patients with COVID-19 and have recorded positive results. Western Cape Premier Alan Windy said the six earliest COVID-19 patients placed on ventilators at the hospital did not survive. However, high flow oxygen was administered to seven more patients and for those, six recovered without the use of ventilators. Wendy said a further 114 patients in the critical care, 70% met the criteria for the use of high flow nasal oxygen and of these, a further 70% recovered. He said this could be a game changer in how critical patients are tested. The National Education Health and Allied Workers Union in the Western Cape has condemned the new testing criteria announced by the Western Cape Provincial Government for the Cape Metro. It will see people tested only if they are already in hospital. If they are over 55, those with comorbidities and those in old age homes, we spoke to the Western Cape Provincial Secretary, Eric Quileta, for more on this. Today I'm with Mr. Eric Quileta, who is the Provincial Secretary of to affiliate the National Health and Allied Workers Union. Good, good day to you, sir. Good day and thanks for having me. So I, I think the first question we want to ask our, for our viewers is what are the conditions of frontline health workers in the Western Cape at this very moment in our um, in the COVID-19 um, pandemic? Yeah, look, uh, simply describing the conditions, uh, uh, we can say that uh, working conditions are unbearable for the frontline workers. And it's just unfortunate that we've been losing the lives of these frontline workers, mostly as a result of the carelessness of the employer in terms of ensuring that they are being protected sufficiently to deal with this particular virus. Are they, um, we do know that health is one of the greatest indicators of inequality in our society, health services provision. 
very uneve unevenly distributed in the province. Um, what has been the support systems um, in place so far for health? Yeah, indeed, uh, the inequality in terms of the healthcare really finds expression and it's mostly exposed during this particular time that those that uh, own the means have got better and affluent health services whilst the bulk and the majority of the poor and the working class are bearing the brand of this particular virus. And currently there's no support system. In fact, we've been asking this question from the MEC. We've written a letter to the Premier and the MEC from as early as the 26th of April. We wanted to meet with them so that they can take us on board. What is the plan in terms of addressing the virus? Up till now, we have not received any acknowledgement or even a response. We just hear them on TV. Whilst we know if a worker is being infected, remember these workers come from poor uh, background. So the average household, you've got not less than eight people. So there's no means sufficient enough to deal with this particular social distancing. Instead, what the employer is doing, they are failing to own the virus. If a worker is infected, they begin to doubt and say, no, but you brought this thing from where you come from. It's not that you obtained it at the workplace. So, so Nahal has issued a statement um, the last hours um, opposing the new testing regime announced by Western Cape Health and the MC leadership of Nova French and Bombo. Why are you opposed to the new testing regime? Yeah, we, we must say that we are appalled, but we are not uh, surprised because we've long held a view that she does not have a plan to deal with this particular virus. She's just been running around like a mascot. Now, this particular changing of the COVID-19 rules, it's a clear problem manifesting itself that you've got a government that does not have a plan. How you manifest it. We are opposing it because it's more like saying everything is in your hands. You must see how you can do it, deal with it. Meaning, if I'm not uh, rich enough to be uh, living in Constantia, then I won't be able to afford because I'm from Kailicha. And we know that in Kailicha, for you to even deal with a headache, you must move from home four o'clock in the morning, go and access a healthcare facility, and then we spend the rest of the day. So, for now, we, we, we are really worried. It's worrisome for us that uh, the minister just decides to leave everything into the hands of uh, the poor people to fend for themselves. So, the new regime, as announced by Western Cape Health, is that the healthy will not be tested. The under 55s will not be tested. Um, only the vulnerable will be tested. Is that, is that correct uh, summation, Mr. Kalita? Yeah, it is, and to an extent, we believe that thing is unscientific. For us to have arrived at the statistics now that is over 24,000 is precisely because of the massive testing that is there. So they deliberately now just want to forget about everyone else that needs to be tested. So they're choosing an option of not knowing than those that they know. Because these tests, yes, as unevenly as they were performed, they at least gave us an extent to understand this particular virus. But now we will just not know anymore what is happening. And on the eve of this pronouncement, Western Cape recorded a thousand new cases. So we will not know what we have recorded from when they promulgated this new thing of theirs moving onwards. Uh, I just want to say, Mr. Quilletta, and in the interest of trying I can't hear you. And the out there watching from the department, they will respond to us. Um, as you've indicated, Mr. Kureta, 23, almost 24,000 cases in the province, 502 deaths. Um, clearly, front 
frontline workers are going to be the most at risk. I need to ask the final question. What is the view of Nahal on the lifting of the alcohol ban, noting the increase of um, pressure which may result um, on hospital services and health services as a result of lifting of the ban? Yeah, as we say, we're strongly opposed to that. But remember, you've got a government in the Western Cape that rules as if they are in the island. They don't consult. They just sleep and wake up the next day and decide. So, unfortunately, that is what we have. Uh, if I can just take it to uh, five of your biggest hospitals are on the brink of a shutdown. Uh, we've reported Tiger Bank, we've reported Grotesquier, we've reported Richard's Plain District Hospital, we've also reported uh, the New Somerset Hospital, where conditions are unbearable for local people, and the cases are just escalating, and there's a serious non compliance with the regulations. So we've asked the Department of Labor to come and inspect. In fact, Tiger Bank is already being declared as. Uh, a hospital that should be closed. And those hospitals are mainly servicing the poor. And with the minister not coming with a proper plan how we are going to navigate through this, it means the poor and the working class are on their own. We continue giving you the latest news from the city, province and abroad. When we come back, we'll be looking at the latest on the Cabinet's decision on the ruling from Pretoria High Court declaring Level 3 and 4 lockdown regulations unconstitutional and invalid and more. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Channel 263 on DSTV and the Friday edition of the Our City COVID-19 show on Cape Town TV. As National Child Protection Week draws to a close, Childline has urged the government to listen to learners' views on returning to school. As schools prepare for the return of learners next week, Childline spokesperson Dumiseli Nala said the pupils they had spoken to had mixed feelings. While it is compulsory to wear a face mask in public to help curb the spread to the COVID-19 virus, not everyone has access to quality masks. In partnership with the Unite for One movement, Metropolitan Life handed over a number of cloth face masks to the principals of Rosendal Secondary School, Loazi Primary School and Butlery Primary School to ensure learners adhere to the regulation. Metropolitan and the Western Cape Education Department have taken the initiative to hand out masks and hand sanitizers to three disadvantaged schools in the Western Cape. Those three schools are Bartillery Primary, Luazi Primary and Rosendal High School. Uh, the Department of Education, Umdana, Vamia, Imnega, Imask, Ezembi. So, Naman, Ziki, Ubandwan, and because the informal settlement, so Banez and Dogos, the communal taps, so Gozaban Zem, Ogos, the Kamba, Imask every day. But in the one, you didn't want to have Umdana, I've been a mask and a buzz here, liquefied, so that I was if I can young, I've been a mask at the Takilai. So, the contribution is for men of the metropolitan is a mask, is a cool. Um, of course, with the help of volunteers and NPOs. And we've noticed that some of our learners um, coming to the feeding um, session uh, didn't wear masks. So um, we have been innovative, yes, but this is an um, absolute uh, benefit uh, to those learners that uh, is attending um, our school. As you know that all of um, the schools have received the PPEs uh, from the Department of Education in the Western Cape. And um, as it is required that um, no mask, no entry. So 
yes, it will definitely help them. They have received two, but this will also help them in terms of having a mask, an extra mask, um, you know, a third or a fourth mask for that matter. Um, coming to school will make it much easier and for them to at least have a fresh one whilst they are washing and drying the others. As you know, winter months are here and there's no guarantees that the mask will be dry the next day. These masks will take us a long way to help the curbing of the spread of the COVID virus. Not just in the schools, but also in the communities where these learners are from. I just want to indicate that uh, it is 10,000 masks. These masks are not just for the three schools that were here this morning, but these masks are for 10,000 learners across the province. Learners who are in grade uh, 12 and learners who are in grade 7 who started with schooling this week. We, we, we had two, two approaches. Uh, we, we have 15,000 that we give basically to our sales teams to take to their clients, a lot of schools. So that was at the, the sales team's discretion. The schools that we sponsored with the Department of Education, we actually asked the department to say, listen, you know where the need is the biggest. Uh, and they identified the schools to say, um, it's, it's according to them, the schools where there's a high need. So it was uh, identified by the Education Department. And I think the, the masks might just keep them more aware, I think, in the one way, because if you may, well, it's not something that we used to, so I think the awareness will be there. And if that reminds them to wash their hands more regularly, so basically a combination of uh, creating a behavior that will help them, because I think the two most critical things is sanitizing and sanitizing and wearing a mask. So the mask is a physical thing, hopefully it reminds them, listen, let me wash my hands. As the students of grade 7 and 12 are due to return to school on the 8th of June, the principals of these three schools say that this initiative taken by Metropolitan has assisted them dearly, as many households are unable to provide hand sanitizers and masks for the students. They say that they will continue practicing social distancing and educating the students about the virus. For our City News, I'm Zanel Mvana, Cape Town. With the lockdown unleashing various capabilities in many South Africans, 13-year-old Tam Emery from Irondebosch started a small Cinnabon baking and delivery initiative. This was in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and was a means to help alleviate hunger. The teenager and her friends have raised over 20,000 rand, which they have donated to Ellen Durin's soup kitchen. This is what she had to say. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, many organizations and people have lent helping hands to help those that are needy. 13-year-old Tam Emery has been one of them. Hi, I'm Tamsin Emery. I'm 13. I'm in grade 7. And I've been baking cinnamon for a local soup kitchen called Happy Feet. It all started when my mom was making soup for Happy Feet. For Happy Feet Soup Kitchen and I helped her deliver the soup to the lady down the road who would take the soup to the soup kitchen and when I was there I also wanted to help but I never knew how to make soup so I decided that I wanted to make Cinnabons to sell and then I could spend the money. Starting a small Cinnabon baking and delivery initiative, Emery and her friends have managed to raise well over 20,000 rand, which they donate to the Happy Feet Soup Kitchen in Langa. I donate 100% of the profits to the Happy Feet Soup Kitchen in Langa. I'm just over 23,000 rand, and I haven't quite worked out how many Cinnabons I've sold. I just enjoy being able to help them doing something that I really enjoy. I have two of my best, best friends who are in grade seven with me. And then there's another girl in grade six called Kate Bisson, who's also helping me. I actually want to become a vet because even though I really, really enjoy baking, I adore animals. What got me through all the days was actually baking every day for to bake cinnabons. Um, I'm quite an outdoorsy person, so being cooped up was a struggle for me, so they can help that. Well, they can do anything. I mean, they, they all have their own strengths, and they can do amazing things with 
aspiring to be a veterinarian and choosing to help the most vulnerable during this pandemic emery wishes to encourage other little girls and 13 year olds to take on initiative and play to their strengths for our city news i am stephanie pitt the Road Traffic Infringement Agency has postponed the implementation of the demerit system for motorists due to the COVID-19. The system would allow drivers to accumulate a maximum of 12 points for various offences, which would ultimately lead to their licences being suspended and in some cases cancelled. The delay is due to severe loss in the revenue to support it. Transport stakeholders have welcomed the news. Minister in the Presidency, Jackson Mtembu, has confirmed the government would appeal the recent ruling by the Gauteng High Court that some of the regulation in lockdown, Level 3 and 4, were unconstitutional. Mtembu added that the national state of disaster had been extended. A special virtual cabinet meeting was held today, Thursday, the 4th of June 2020, to discuss developments in South Africa's efforts to save lives and protect livelihoods amid the COVID-19 pandemic. As part of this discussion, Cabinet reflected on the North Houting High Court judgment delivered by Justice Norman Davis on Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020. That uh, judgment declared the COVID-19 lockdown regulations in level three and level four unconstitutional and invalid. After obtaining legal advice and listening to numerous comments made by members of the legal fraternity in reaction to this judgment, we are of the view that another court might come to a different conclusion on the matter. Cabinet has therefore decided to appeal the North Houghton High Court decision. Government will ask that its appeal be heard on an urgent basis so that all of us can obtain certainty on the regulations. The Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamine Zuma, will be joined in this appeal by President Cyril Ramaphosa and the Minister of Health, Dr. Zwedim Kize. Cabinet wishes to assure the nation that all interventions introduced since the declaration of a state of national disaster in March 2020 by President Cyril Ramaphosa have been directed primarily at saving lives of our people. The restrictions placed on the movement of individuals and on the level of activity in the, in the economy have been directed at slowing the spread of COVID-19 infections. While government appeals the court judgment, current regulations remain in force. And we appeal and urge all our people to observe all the health protocols that have been put in place, including washing of hands, social distancing, wearing of masks in public, as well as screening and referral for testing where necessary. Cabinet also approved the extension of the national state of disaster by another month from the 15th of June to the 15th of July 2020. As we all know, the national state of disaster can only last for three months or 90 days. And the three months or 90 days of the current state of the national state of disaster expires on the 15th of June uh, this month. That's why it was then necessary uh, for the Minister of Cocta to request cabinet to extend the state of national disaster by another month, which uh, is allowed in law. That's all from the news run, but when we come back, Stephanie Pitt will update us on the international news and what's trending on social media.
Welcome back. You're still watching the Our City COVID-19 show. I'm Stephanie Pitt. South America's most populous country, Brazil, now has the highest number of confirmed coronavirus cases. But why have cases continued to increase in the region despite the government having acted quickly to prepare for the virus? The World Health Organization provided an analysis to answer these questions. My question is, why is the situation so bad in South America and in Central America, in spite of the fact that um, many of the countries in the region have taken um, measures and taken them very early, including strict lockdowns? And a related question is, as far as we know about the behavior of the virus in other parts of the world, what would you recommend to Latin American governments to stop the spread of the virus? I can, I can begin. <clears throat> I think, first of all, when we look at Latin America in general, it's important, uh, and, 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 and the Americas in general, it's important to distinguish that, the, as happened in Europe, as happened in, in Southeast Asia, the epidemic is not at the same stage of development in each and every country. Uh, the small island states in the Caribbean have done a superb job in containing the virus and in, in stopping disease and in saving lives. But we are very concerned about Haiti at the moment because of its unique circumstance, its unique fragility, and the fact that the disease is accelerating in a highly vulnerable population. And I think you can say the same on each sub-region for the Central America. Similarly, we are concerned uh, about uh, the disease situation in, in, in places like Nicaragua. However, we're seeing a different scenario in, in other countries. Um, similarly, in, in, in South America, we see increasing uh, continued intense community transmission in places like Peru in Brazil um, and, and in other countries. Um, the, uh, we, we might have said the same thing a number of weeks ago uh, in, in Europe uh, or in North America or other places. Why is the situation so bad? The epidemic has developed <clears throat> in each and every region or sub-region in a slightly different way, but what has been common to many regions has been intense community transmission. And it is clear that once that intense community transmission has been established, <clears throat> it's very difficult to root the virus out. <clears throat> and it takes <clears throat> a comprehensive strategy, not just public health and social measures. It requires to have uh, a highly involved and empowered community. It requires strong coordination and governance at, at, at government level. It requires an all of society uh, approach. It requires sustained commitment. Uh, and it also, uh, even in those situations, even in those situations, you see particular settings in which the disease can take off and cause a tremendous amount of, 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 of uh, suffering and, and, and death. We see that scenario in Europe and in North America in long-term care facilities. We've seen that emerge uh, in, in, um, in closed settings, uh, in, in uh, detention centers, in, in others. So there are particular settings in which the disease can amplify um, and cause uh, more difficulties. Uh, We've been saying uh, again and advising uh, since uh, the beginning of, of, of this uh, uh, global epidemic to, that it's this <clears throat> ability to implement a whole series of measures across society uh, that, ha that allow a country to, to bring a disease under control, continue to suppress the virus and ultimately exit all of these measures. We've seen many, many, many good examples of that. And it's not that every country has done the same thing. Uh, what's been remarkable in this is that countries have done slightly different things according to their context, but what countries that have been successful have done is they've taken all of those measures. They've been very serious about community engagement. They've been very, very serious about educating people and bringing the community along with them. They've been clear in their communications. They've let the response be driven by science. They have implemented and tried to sustain surveillance and finding the virus at all times during the response, even though it's very, very difficult when you have very intense transmission. And they have focused on targeting their public health and social measures and sustaining those measures and only lifting those measures when they see indications that they're making progress. So it's not one thing or another. So in terms of advising countries in Central and South America, <clears throat> it's about persistence, it's about consistency, it's about making sure that your messages are clear, making sure your community is on board, uh, and ensuring that uh, you're driven by science, driven by the evidence, 
that evidence is, lo is global in the sense that there are global uh, facts and, and global knowledge, but it's also local. There's a local context and there's local learning. So there's, we need to adapt global knowledge, but we need to implement with local knowledge as well. And I think countries that have matched the global science uh, with their local knowledge, and they've been consistent and persistent in that, they're the ones that have had success. Um, so there is no absolute recipe for success. There is no SOP, there is no algorithm that gives you success against this virus. Uh, it is a set, a complex set of, um, <clears throat> of actions implemented by responsible governments, driven by science, who are prepared to sustain their action for as long as it takes to suppress and stop this virus. If I might add, just to say, to supplement what Mike has said, that many countries uh, in other parts of the world are exactly where countries in Latin America are right now in seeing some very intense transmission and, and outbreaks, and we can learn from them, um, and we can learn from, from, from each other. And what we've seen in, in many countries where the situation just seemed overwhelming, um, where the, the, it, was, it was unclear where, where exactly the virus is, it just seems like it's everywhere. What we've seen many countries do is target their efforts and prioritize their efforts to, to find out where are the highest, where's the highest concentration of this virus? Where's the highest concentration of um, the, the virus itself circulating? And what we know about this virus is that it likes close contact with people. And when the public health workforce and the testing strategy focuses on um, closed settings and vulnerable people, um, and you start testing those appropriately, and you, and you use your limited supplies and limited workforce in targeted areas, you can start to see the boundaries of where that outbreak actually is. Um, and that really helps focus all of the efforts for the contact tracers, for your testing strategy, um, mobilizing your clinical care facilities to, to care for individuals. And it helps narrow down the problem bit by bit. Um, and tackling this virus at the lowest administrative level as you can is helpful. Looking at it at the, at the national level is one thing and having a strong national plan, but implementing these efforts at the lowest administrative level will be helpful to help you find where the virus is and target what you need uh, to do. Um, now let's take a look at the popular hashtags on Twitter today. Hashtag Cyril Ramaphosa. The president has arrived in Cape Town and was received by Premier Alan Windy. He has stormed the 850 field hospital at the Cape Town International Convention Center and was told the facility was the biggest dedicated COVID-19 hospital in Africa. Hashtag Father's Day. It's Father's Day in two weeks time and already Twitter is full of stories of young people growing up without their dads and telling how they are playing such vital roles in their children's lives now. We'd like to know your views on burning issues during this pandemic, so we'll be posting burning questions on our Facebook page daily, Our City CT. You can also follow us on Twitter at Our City CT. That's it from me, Stephanie Pitt. Please stay with us. After the break, Michaela Miller will be giving you information on resources and places of safety you can access during this period. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuning into Our City, the COVID show on Cape Town TV, Channel 263. Here's a recap of today's headlines. The Bonteville community gathered for a candlelight vigil on Thursday night as residents mourned the loss of a father and son killed in gang violence. Neo Western Cape and condemned the new testing criteria announced by the provincial government for the Cape Metro citizens and government to appeal a Pretoria High Court that declared Level 3 and 4 lockdown regulations unconstitutional and invalid. If you are in need of any assistance, here are some organisations helping communities stay safe during this period.
that's it from the Our City COVID-19 News Show. But we will continue giving you the latest news on what's happening in Cape Town on our Facebook page at Our City CT and on Twitter at Our City CT. You can also get in touch with us via email on ourcity at capetowntv.org or call us on 021-448-0448. From me, Michaela Miller and the Our City News crew, goodbye until Monday and enjoy the weekend. <laughs>